Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to share this session with you and with uh, wonderful colleagues from uh, Canada and from Saudi Arabia and from the uh, Far East. Actually, my presentation today is about the acute uh, fulminant invasive fungal rhinosinusitis in specialized age groups, in children, immunocompromised children. Uh, we have actually challenges. These challenges that we are dealing with a specialized form of disease, it's a fulminant with a high morbidity and mortality, and at the same time, we are dealing with children which uh, are specialized uh, age groups, very critical age groups to, de to deal with. Being immunocompromised further adds to the challenge. They have anemia, they have low total leukocytic counts, low uh, absolute neutrophilic counts, and furthermore, receiving immunosuppressant agents for their bone marrow transplants or for their leukemia or whatever. The pathogenesis, actually, the acute fulminant fungal rhinosinusitis, it's not a, a, a disease which be uh, transmitted from patient to patient. No, it's a disease which is uh, coded from the environment. We have these fungi present in, in, the, in the decaying matter, in the soil, in, in fruits. So once these patients got the immunity suppressed, they are going to be candidate for such an infections. The organisms then proliferate in the paranasal vasculatures and causing ischemic necrosis and destruction of the mucosa and the bone with hematogenous and perineural spread. Our study, we have collected 11 immunocompromised patients with an age range between 4 and 15 years with hematologic and lympho lymphopoietic neoplasms. They are included in our study. These are six patients having acute myelogenous leukemias, three patients having acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and two patients having Burkitt's lymphoma. Clinically, initially, there is fever. In 90% of these patients, we have fever, we have rhinorrhea, nasal congestion, facial pain, facial numbness. With the orbital spread, although this is not the case in our study, because we have nev never met cases of orbital study in children, but with a orbital spread, this is common in the adults. So with the orbital spread, the patient may complain of diplopia or loss of visions with cranial nerve deficits and ulceration of the nasal and palatal mucosa, which is the common presentation in children, and maybe even facial skin affections, like we can see here. This is a child with a fistula over the lateral aspect of the nose. This is the fistula. And this is his nasal mucosa. You can notice the septal perforation over there in the same child. Nasal examination, we have serosanguinous nasal discharge, pale mucosa bloodless, necrotic crustacean on the septum, and turbinates, and septal or palatal ulceration, as you have just seen. This is the shape of the mucosa. It's pale, necrotic, in the lateral nasal roll, as you can see. Differential diagnosis from pyogenic orbital infections and pyogenic orbital cellulitis should be differentiated. Actually, as I've just told you, we have a, a, a we haven't met the cases of orbital infections in pediatrics, but we have met these cases in adults. But at least you should know the difference. Because this patient, for example, is an orbital cellulite complicating ethmoidites, bacterial infection. You have the red signs, you have the red congested eyelids, proptosis. But in our patients, you have lax periorbita, you have ischemia. So you don't have that proptosa, you don't have that red sign. This is. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the, what you can see, the lax periorbita, the pale, the pallor, but the minimal proptosis, not the severe proptosis. Just a moment, because I lost the presentation. I'm sorry. Again, and this is one of our cases. You have the edema, but not that aggressive redness if compared to the bacterial infections. And this is the necrosis over the turbinate. The severity of the illness is actually disproportionate to the typical picture of the sinusitis. You don't expect to have severe form of sinusitis clinically, but although these patients have a, a, a really advanced situations, they have got necrosis of the turbines, palatal perforations, septal perforations, although the minimal symptoms, it's just fever, facial pain, numbness, congestion, that's it. 
The clinician should have a high suspicion index in any immunocompromised patients, whether adults or, or, chil or children, with fever and rhinosinusitis until the diagnosis of fungal infection is established. Biopsy from the turbinate is mandatory. Imaging, actually, again, you do not expect too much signs on radiology, but in early signs you can find, for example, this patient's having opacity over the sinus, as you can see here, with no bone destruction evident on CT. Evidence of bone destruction is late finding, and scan can be absent despite of the extension of the lesion beyond the confinements of the bone because it, pa it passes or spreads through the, through the vasculatures and through the perineural spread. MRI can be used for in evaluating mucosal skin invasion as well as orbital and intracranial extensions. This is an example of the CT scanning showing brain abscess in an adult patient, not a children, because as you will uh, see, in our children, the morbidity is just confined to the nose and the sinuses. And this is an MRI and again in an adult patient with our patients having cavernous sinus thrombosis to compare the difference between children and the adults because in our series of 11 patients, we haven't met a case of orbital or intracranial extensions. This is the pathology we find. We have the aspergillosis in seven patients. This is the aspergillus. And this is the mucus in the other four cases. Actually, rhizopus or uh, the zygomyces haven't been met in our series. The treatments, combined medical and surgical treatments, correction of the underlying immunocompromised condition, the white cell transfusion and granulocytic stimulation factors, the absolute neutrophilic count should exceed 1,500 per cubic millimeters. You should raise the absolute neutrophilic count. This is mandatory. Control of diabetes, although this is not a problem in children. Systematic antifungal infection is mandatory. The amphotericin B and the most important and the better generation, the liposomal amphotericin B, the ambisome, is much preferred, being of less renal side effects and less renal side, side, uh, toxicity. This is the lipid based amphotericin. The hyperbaric oxygen is again a very important adjuvant factor because it improves the migration of the polymorphs and the macrophages and allows the fibroblasts to lay down the collagens for the healing. It elevates the acidosis in the tissues as well. This is one of the cases. As you can see here, this patient has got even facial paralysis on the right side. And you know that the facial is coming from, from far posteriorly, from the stylomastoid foramen, to imagine the extent of the, of the spread of the lesions from the nose and the sinuses along the skull base to reach even the posterior fossa and affects the stylomastoid foramen exit of the facial nerve. This is the patient from inside. This is the nasal mucosa, this is the, on the right side, this is the septum, and this is the lateral nasal wall. You can notice here the bloodless mucosa. The mucosa is coming out with the suction. You can just make the suction and it comes out in, in most of the mucosa. And this is the perforation of the septum on your right side, and this is the palatal mucosa. Sorry, this is the nasal mucosa from the lateral nasal wall. It's totally dead. This is the huge septal perforation, as you can see. This is the left side, this is the right side, and this is the perforation. You need to do the extensive debridement. You shouldn't left behind you any necrotic tissues because this represents a focus, an idus for reinfections. So now you can see the blood coming because now you are approaching the vitalized, the normal tissues behind. But all the tissues before that were extensively ischemic and necrotic. This is the right cavity, this is the left cavity, this is the debridement. And you don't imagine how much is the debridement. If we go further posteriorly, you will see here even the posterior pharyngeal wall mucosa is affected. It's an extensive pathology, and this was the debridement. This was the tissues taken from the end, from the posterior pharyngeal wall mucosa as well. And this is the clivus. You can see the bare clival bone over there. It's really an extensive pathology, extensive necrosis, and you need to remove it all, not to leave any residual necrotic tissues. This is another patient. This is the necrosis over the inferior turbinate, and this is the macerated skin from the poor vitality of these patients. This is the patient, and this is the inferior turb on the right side, totally necrotic, and you can even dissect it over the normal remainder mucosa. You take it out.
you can notice that there is no blood. We are dealing with alive patients, a living patients, and you dissect it, but no blood because it's bloodless. When you face blood, now you are approaching the normal tissues, and you need to remove, as I mentioned, the whole necrosis. This is the necrotic tissues. And this is the patient's lacerated skin. This is her eye. This is the bald head because she's under chemotherapy. This was at the time where she was really in a poor situation during the surgery, during the debridement, and this is the debridement. And finally, this is the patient's few months later with the hair coming again after she had raised her immunity and controlled everything. This is the thir third case of the same situations. And this particular patient was having like a mass effect. I didn't mention a mass effect in acute leukemia, in, sorry, in acute uh, fulminant, fulminant uh, fungal rhinocinocytes because it's a, a matter of vascularity, a matter of invasion of the vessels and the perineurium. But in this particular case, when we deal with this patient, actually, this is the necrosis on the right side. And this is the debridement. This is the bare periorbita, the lamina papyrisia. We need to go through the lamina because she has got a mass within the orbit, and we wonder what that, that mass in such an acute case. This is the periorbita. Now we dissect the periorbit. We remove the whole lamina, and this is the periostom of the orbit. We are pushing the orbit from outside. We are splitting now the periosteum, supporting the orbit from outside, and splitting the periorbita, and dissect the periosteum to take out the mass. Actually, it was invasion of the leukemic, of the, of the lymph, of the fungal tissues within the periorbita itself. So this is the periorbital fat was invaded by the fungus itself. And this is the media rectus muscle. Totally, the mass was dissected off the mass of the muscle, sorry. And this is the patient's later, few weeks later, after the surgery. Our results that in series of, uh, sorry, it was 11 cases, no mortality. None of these cases have ophthalmoplegia. None of these cases progressed to intracranial complications. The morbidity was found in septal perforations was found in eight cases, palatal perforations in two cases, and skin fistula in one. And we have a mixture of these pathologies together in these 11 patients. Our conclusion is that the acute fulminant invasive fungal rhinosinusitis is a disease with a high morbidity and mortality. The immunocompromised children are also candidates, not only the adults, but children as well, are candidates for the disease due to the anemia, the low total leukocytic count, the low and uh, absolute neutrophilic count. Astonishingly, the prognosis in children with this, kind, with this kind of disease is much better than adults with the diabetic ketoacidosis if started treatment early and aggressively. We recommended biopsies of suspicious lesions, and you should have the high index of suspicion in this particular patient group, immunocompromised children. If these patients have got persistent fever, resistant to any treatments, you should think of the possibility of acute fulminant, fulminant invasive fungal rhinosinusitis. Endoscopic examination is helpful in the diagnosis, the mucosa is pale, bloodless, and otherwise it, it's going to be gangrenous later, later on. This is a bunch of my family members of children's, and I would like to thank you very much. <laughs>